Well, welcome to the Brussels Forum, a gathering of top-level global uh, political leaders, government officials, and opinion formers, hosted by the German Marshall Fund here in Brussels. Leading our discussion, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the new Director of Policy Planning in President Obama's State Department. Until January, she was out of government and analyzing how well governments do as Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. From the other side of the US political spectrum, Robert Kagan, prolific analyst, historian, and writer on foreign policy. He advised John McCain's Republican presidential campaign. Carl Bildt, Sweden's foreign minister, former prime minister from July. He'll oversee Sweden's tenure as the European Union presidency, including relations with the United States. And finally, Lord Mark Malik Brown, British Minister for Africa, Asia, and the United Nations, where he served as Deputy Secretary General. His relations then with the US administration on policy were at times complex and fraught. Welcome to you all. Well, Anne Marie Slaughter, let me pick up with you. Uh, let's sample how the US now views Europe. What is the view in Washington of Europe as a global power? Is it a single entity with an effective unified voice or one enfeebled by division and lack of unity on global affairs? So Europe has a telephone number and it is here in Brussels. Do you have it in your uh, pocket? Uh, I have several uh, for the Troika. <laughs> is that still the problem? <laughs> We know where they are. It is still still a plural head, but one head. Uh, Europe is our essential partner. It's our principal partner in everything uh, that we want to do. Uh, indeed, the problems we face uh, globally cannot possibly be solved, from climate change to counterterrorism to nuclear proliferation uh, to the various regional problems in the Middle East uh, and other places in the world, without the United States and Europe working together. So Europe is our principal partner and our essential partner. Well, just before you went into government, you wrote about the crisis of American foreign policy. Um, is the crisis about how Europe seems, or actually is it America's crisis about being able, unable to adapt to the new reality of Europe? Oh, I don't think it's, it's about not being able to adapt uh, to the new reality of Europe. We, the United States has encouraged a strong Europe for 60 years. Uh, this is in U.S. interests to have a strong Europe, a united Europe. Uh, there, there was adaptation to the new world after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, certainly, and it's, it's not always smooth. There's no close relationship that is always smooth. Indeed, often the closer you are, the freer you are to, to speak very frankly. Uh, I think the crisis of American foreign policy was much more about adapting to a whole different set of global forces that affect us all. It is not just a world of geopolitics, of, of power politics, of state-to-state -state relations. It's that world, but it's also a world where we face important threats by non-state actors and by, from Mother Nature herself. And in that arena, uh, we have to work collaboratively. Have you discovered, since you went to the State Department, what, six weeks ago, whether there is a crisis in American foreign policy? Not now. <laughs> No, we, we have, we have a, a tremendous array of issues. This is no secret that the incoming administration faces a, a, an extraordinary array of problems domestically uh, and globally, but uh, I think the, the new foreign policy team signaled immediately uh, the closeness of our relations to Europe. General Jones uh, and Vice President Biden came to the Munich conference as the first trips uh, of the new administration abroad before even the president went to Canada. The Secretary Clinton did go to Asia, but then immediately came here and of course President Obama uh, will be here very soon. Let me move to Bob Kagan, uh, the other side of the political spectrum. The first line of your book on paradise and power, America and, and Europe in the New World Order reads, it's time to stop pretending the Americans and Europeans share a common view of the world or even that they occupy the same world. Do you still say that? Well I think we're back to pretending again obviously. I mean, obvi there's no question that our destiny... What do you mean? Hang on, what do you mean by that? Back to pretending. Well, we're, we're back, now that the long international nightmare has ended, we're back to assuming that the United States and Europe uh, really see eye to eye about everything. It's just a matter of 
whether we have nice conversations. And I think we need to take more seriously uh, we're not, and not kid ourselves, that one of the challenges of this relationship, which I think is essential, and if you ask me whether Europe is our most important partner, the answer is certainly yes. But one of the challenges is dealing with the fact that we do not actually see the world uh, in exactly the same way on some very important issues. Uh, the use of force, international institutions, and that's true even with uh, this new administration in Washington. Uh, you mentioned the Munich speeches. One of the things that Vice President Biden said at Munich uh, was that we need a bargain between the United States and Europe. Yes, we will listen. Yes, we will do uh, diplomacy and development and democracy, uh, as Vice President Biden said. But you Europeans also need to rethink uh, your view on some things, and he mentioned specifically uh, the use of force. And I think that on issues ranging from Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan, potentially Iran, uh, let's not kid ourselves that we are in complete sync, because that is not helpful to the relationship, actually. But I have to press you. You've made your career and reputation uh, underscoring this enormous gulf you say you identified earlier uh, in, uh, what, three or four years ago, between America and Europe. You wrote at one point, Americans are from Mars, and Europeans are from Venus. Did I write that? <laughs> are those planets coming together at all? Because you seem to suggest they might be. Or is your analysis still as stark? Uh, at the end of that stark analysis, I said I hope that statesmanship on both sides could deal with these differences once we recognize them. And I think that it's absolutely the case that this administration uh, does have uh, the opportunity to show that kind of statesmanship, and we clearly have that kind of statesmanship in Europe. But let's not begin the uh, resetting of this relationship by ignoring some basic differences, because we'll have to grapple with those differences, and they are apparent on a whole range of issues already. Uh, that the Obama administration has set forth positions, which I think if we were honest, Europe is not entirely in agreement with, or at least large, seg large segments of Europe. But let me be clear, you have said in recent days that the problem with U.S.-Europe relations was not about the existence, as you put it, of the wrong president. You're saying there are still fundamental challenges which are, are unresolved and still very marked. Absolutely. And I don't, why should we pretend otherwise? Anne-Marie Slaughter? I again think you're, you're confusing the idea of being close partners and allies with perfect harmony. I'm there was no, 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 no. But, the, but the, <laughs> the, you know, all through the Cold War, there were co continual disagreements. There were disagreements over how to deal with the Soviet Union. There were disagreements uh, about different other other regional issues. There were huge disagreements about Vietnam. And yet, we were close partners. We were a community of values, a community of, of democracies, uh, and 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 very close partners on the issues that mattered. So the the point of partnership is not to agree. I totally agree we need to recognize where there are differences. We need to engage where there are differences. And I also agree Europe is, has put much more into civilian power. The United States has put more into military power. We are converging in various ways, but we are not, we are not completely overlapping, and we do not always see eye to eye. From my point of view, that makes it a vigorous and active partnership and a more equal one, and we need it uh, to be that kind of a partnership. But Robert Kagan, you're saying there are still fundamental fissures out there. But it doesn't prevent us from being good partners. I agree. But there are fundamental fissures, and we can, I'm sure maybe we'll get into the specific issues where these differences uh, uh, make themselves manifest. But this is not even something that, that I'm just saying. Uh, I thought when President Sarkozy recently said, does Europe want peace or to be left in peace, he was raising an interesting question and an open question. Uh, and I think that's something that Europeans are also uh, grappling with right now, with the statements of the uh, British Defense Secretary about Europe's contribution, uh, contribution in NATO. Uh, many European leaders have raised these issues, and rightly so. We should grapple with them directly. Right. That's the view from Mars. Let's get the view from Venus. Carl Bildt. Uh, are, you are, you, are, are you grappling with it? Uh, you've I'm just from Sweden. <laughs> You've just been uh, at a European summit. Yep. Is Europe grappling with this in the way that uh, we've just heard? Grappling with the transatlantic relationship or grappling with, with the issues or grappling with both? both. W w of course we are. I mean, Europe or the European Union is work in progress. Um, I think there's been some difficulty on the American side of the Atlantic to adjust to the fact that there is a European Union that is gradually emerging as uh, an actor on the global stage. Um, I wouldn't necessarily blame the Americans too much for that, because I think that difficulty of adjusting to that is there also inside the different European countries. This is work in progress. 
Uh, go back 10 years, we were very different. Go back further 20 years, we're extremely different. Uh, we are moving forward and we are understanding there are differences in political cultures in our different countries. But what we do understand, it, it is only by working together that we have any possibility of any results whatsoever. And that applies to the transatlantic relationship as well. But there may be a lot of people out there who say, work in progress, everything's work in progress. But when, yeah. you, when you hear the fundamental fissures that uh, Robert Kagan has no. identified, uh, okay, five or six years ago now, but he's saying they're still there. No, I, I wouldn't call it fundamental fissures. But, but of course, the political culture, or let's call it strategic culture, of the United States and most European countries is a different one. There are also differences between the different European countries. But there is the recognition, and that's a fundamental one, that is only by working together that we can tackle the great issues of the day. Uh, be that climate change, or be that the peace of everything between Palestine and the Punjab. Uh, there's nothing that Sweden can do, or even Europe on its own, or even the United States on its own. It's only by working together, also with other partners on the global scene, that we have any chance whatsoever of mastering these particular challenges. So it's a, part of, it's a question of overcoming the divisions that are coming from history by meeting the challenges of the I future. need to go, though, back to Anne-Marie Slaughter. You say you've got the phone number, but have you actually got 27 phone numbers of well, 27 nations as opposed to this work in progress that Carl Bildt talks about? No, I said I had three, and I have three because the Europe foreign, European foreign policy structure is a troika with the Commission and the Council and the Special Representative. That's a difference. Europe operates differently, but it doesn't mean it can't operate as an effective whole. And I, I have to speak to Robert Kagan's fundamental fissures. Fundamental fissures, that means a deep difference in values. That means a deep difference in how you see the world. That is not what we're talking about here. We have common values. We, the original argument was Europe is all about peace and the United States is all about war. That's, that's an, clearly not right. And more generally, the Europeans have got troops in Africa. They've got troops in Afghanistan. Many had troops in Iraq. We also, of course, recognize the tremendous value of soft power, of civilian power. These are differences at the tactical level. They are not fundamental fissures. Mark Malik Brown, let me come to you, uh, both with your former uh, UN hat on and now uh, as a Minister of State in the British Foreign Office, looking at it as much from Asia, Africa and the United Nations. Does Europe have a unified foreign policy which is out there to impress not just the Americans but large numbers of other countries? Well, I certainly think a certain distance from Brussels uh, in those places, Africa and Asia, means that in fact there is a pretty coherent Europe. Uh, it's, not a very, it's, it's not defined perhaps in great detail, but there is a sense that Europe is espousing something of a soft power complementarity to the US, doing more on the aid side in Africa, uh, trying to do a lot on uh, trade, trying in places like Afghanistan to uh, perhaps not fully pull its weight always on the military side, but at least supplement it on the development, police building, institution building side. And that kind of broad, crude division of labor, you know, is something that I think most of the world sees. The other thing that I have to say, and this is from someone who lived for 20-odd years in the States, coming back to Europe, one's reminded that geographically, Europe's in the middle of things. Mm -hmm. It's on the way to Afghanistan. It's on the way to the Middle East and Iran. It's on the way to Russia. And in that sense, I, I, I think you're, you're left with this sort of inevitability of partnership we may not agree on everything, but we're a natural stopping point for the U.S. in terms of trying to put together a coalition of soft, hard power, a coalition of allies, uh, action together at the U.N., whatever it is, to try and address these problems. Robert Kagan, do you, do you buy what the voices you're hearing from, uh, from Europe on this? Well, certainly. And, and you know, it, this isn't a cartoon conversation. Uh, we are talking about the need for cooperation. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that cooperation requires understanding of differences. And I don't think we should be scared of these differences, which you seem to be, Anne-Marie. Um, and I think that once we understand them, we can begin to grapple with them. Now, when you raise the question of the distribution of labor, 
you know, we have in a way revisited, we're now revisiting some issues that cropped up in the 1990s when again we had uh, a fairly internationalist American administration dealing with a fairly friendly Europe and yet these issues of distribution of labor really did come up. I mean, it was in those years that Europeans complained that we were moving to a situation where, as one European put it, the United States makes the dinner and Europe does the dishes. Um, the idea that we're going to be using fundamentally American hard power uh, with European soft power, what, the, uh, what Robert Gates, the current Secretary of Defense, called a two-tiered alliance structure, uh, I think that has dangers. It has dangers for Europeans, and I worry about American domestic public opinion. If, if Afghanistan is going to be difficult, and the perception is, is that the Americans and the British uh, and, and the Canadians and others are doing the dying and others are doing the soft power, um, that could be a problem. Well, I, I think certainly, and, we, and I, maybe it's easier for me as a UK minister to say it, because after all, we are the number two contributor in Afghanistan, and we're very proud of being there beside you, and you know, we want to do as much as possible as we can on the military side, and I think that goes uh, for other European countries as well. But you know, I think the challenge to Europe is, you know, coming into a new president, uh, we should have dreamed for a soft power crisis, because that should show us at our best, and the global economy should be that soft power crisis. But I think it's posing a huge challenge challenge to us uh, to live up uh, to some of uh, the things coming out of Washington, where I think rightly there's a call for bold global leadership. And that's going to be a first test. You know, this perhaps even more than Afghanistan is going to show can we work together or not. And the foot is on, uh, the shoe is on our foot, uh, not America's, to prove we can. But I, I want to come back. This, of course we're not afraid of differences. I mean, American culture assumes that within a common framework of trust and common values, Conflict is a healthy thing. Conflict is something that, that you, you, you air, that brings you closer together as you resolve conflict. Absolutely, there are differences. But what I'm trying to point out is there's been huge convergence since you originally wrote your article. Robert Gates, our Secretary of Defense, calling for an increase in soft power. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Europe calling for a, working on a common security and defense policy. France rejoining NATO. NATO reaching for a new strategic concept. Talk of EU and NATO relations much closer. That's Europe recognizing it has to have more hard power at the same time that the U.S. is openly saying we need more soft power. Europe has recognized this for a long time. I mean, the great impetus for the Euro common defense policy in Europe was the Balkan Wars of the 1990s and the perception that America was wielding too much in inordinate military power, and this is bad for Europe. And look at the difficulty. I'm not, I, of course I want Europe to succeed. It's very important for Europe to be powerful, uh, as Sarkozy says, both politically and military as well as in these other ways. But look at the difficulty that Europe is having. We can't pretend that there haven't been difficulties meeting even Europe's own goals, especially at a time when we, America's not standing in the way uh, in any respect. And it is a difficulty that Europe is having. And let's not, we can't pretend that's not true. When Vice President Biden says Americans and Europeans really still look to one another before they look to anyone else, is that true, Carl Bildt? I think that's true. Uh, I think that's been true for a long time, although there have been difficulties in going from looking at each other to talking to each other and, and having concrete <laughs> results. Uh, but, 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 but I do think when it comes to tackling the different issues of the world, the Europeans look first at the Americans and see, can we do a partnership there? That's been difficult. And I think the same has historically applied to the Americans. Then we are looking increasingly to the Latin Americans, the Chinese, the Indians and the others, but this is still the core of the global coalition that is needed. But are you concerned when you have the European presidency for the second six months of this year that actually America may not be getting in touch with you as much as they're getting in touch with China, Japan but, and but, elsewhere? I mean, it depends somewhat on the issues. And we are developing our relationship with China, Brazil, India. We are global power in our own right of a different nature than the American one. But still, the number one relationship that is necessary in order to tackle all of the challenges that we face is the transatlantic one. And the other relationships are increasingly important if you compare it to 10, 15, 20 years ago, but 
it doesn't replace this one. It is Mark the Madden core Brown. Brown. Yeah, I mean, I think we still are the first to talk to each other, but no longer about each other, uh, because we're both now uh, regions or country in a region who are uh, consumed with how we both refashion our relationships with a much more global, much more multipolar world, uh, where we have a common interest in not having an introverted transatlantic relationship, but finding ways to work together globally. Right, let me take some other views um, from uh, those who are here. Um, can I go, uh, could you bring the microphone down to Charles Grant, please, for the first one. Charles Grant, Director of the Centre for European Reform. Sit down, Charles, it's fine. <laughs> it's too complicated if everyone stands up. Everybody's talking about... Start again, can you? Charles Grant, Centre for European Reform. People are talking as if the Europeans are united on key questions of foreign and defence policy. And to my regret, they're not. For 20 years, been trying to make a common foreign policy. For 10 years, a common defence policy. On key issues, we're very divided. On Russia, some countries believe in standing up to Russia robustly. Others are just scared to criticise it. On enlargement, about half the member states believe in extending the boundaries further to Ukraine and Turkey. Half the member states don't want to at all. And on defence, we're completely divided. Uh, a small number of member states take defence seriously. They have soldiers in the south of Afghanistan. They spend a lot on defence. They, they have good capabilities. Uh, other member states apparently want to live in a big Switzerland, happy and secure in their prosperity without worrying about uh, problems in other parts of the world. So I think we have these huge strategic rifts dividing Europe, which makes us a weak and ineffective partner for the new administration, sadly. When you say it's work in progress, Carl Bildt, do you actually accept that kind of criticism? I would, ex if I were a visionary, which I am sometimes, like Charles, I would say much work remains to be done. Uh, but I would but argue that we are... you can't keep using that as an explanation. No, no, no but we are, we, are, we, are, we are far more united now than we have been in the past, and I would argue that we are a fairly effective global actor now, much more so than ten years ago or even five years ago. We are not united on everything. Uh, the same applies to the Americans. We've had more inter-American debate on this panel than inter-European debate. And we all know that in order to deal with Washington, one telephone number does not solve the problem. Uh, I mean, the trans-potomac divide is sometimes bit more bitter than the transatlantic divide um, uh, when it is with how we deal with the different sorts of issues. So we're not united in everything, uh, but we are acting more coherently than we've done ever before. I, I just want to add a little bit of historical perspective. When I came of age in international relations in, in the early 1980s, there was eurosclerosis. There was not even a single market. The, the, the whole, the, we hadn't had 1992, we hadn't had Maastricht. If you just view it from the perspective of decades, the progress in the last two decades has been extraordinary. Of course it's not there yet. And it's going to take a good while and it'll never be a United States of Europe. It will always be looser and there will always be many more differences. But honestly, if we, of course if you go back to 1945, but even if you go back to 1985, the Europe of today, the EU of today, is unrecognizable from that point of view. That's the view from Foggy Bottom from the State Department. Uh, Senator Voinovich. I think that uh, it's interesting that many of us agree that uh, from a public diplomacy point of view, uh, we, were at a, we were at a low ebb. Uh, now we've elected uh, President Obama and there are great expectations that the situation is going to change and you're talking about soft power, but it really I think that the Obama doctrine ought to be uh, uh, smart, power smart power together. And I think that if you're talking about the relationship between the United States and Europe, you've got to bring in Russia. And the President's now talked about resetting and rebooting uh, that relationship. Uh, and I believe that can't happen without some type of strategic dialogue, uh, a very robust dialogue. And the real question is, are the conditions now in place uh, going to lend itself to that kind of uh, robust uh, discussion and, and to see if we can't change the trajectory of Russia. Because if we don't, I think a lot of what we're talking about is going to be very influenced. Let me take a couple more views. Lord Wallace here, please. Uh, William Wallace has a one, mo one, 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 moment, one moment, William. Let's just check if we can get a camera to you. Okay. William Wallace, House of Lords in London. You've talked about the old security agenda. I just want to ask how easy it is to get 
a, a relatively common view on some of the aspects of our new security agenda, above all climate change and energy, mm. on which it's been very difficult under the last U.S. administration to form a relatively coherent view. Do you think that with a different administration in Washington, but with some incoherence in the European Union about our energy policy, in particular our energy dependence, we can begin to get a coherent approach to these rising global issues. Let me move down here another American voice, Kurt Volker, the ambassador of the United States to NATO at the front. Uh, thank you. I wanted to turn the discussion a little bit more on to Afghanistan. Well, no, could, could I ask you to pause on that because I'd like to move on to that in a moment, okay. uh, Ambassador, because there are other things I want, I want to discuss before we get to that point. Does anyone else want to enter this particular area at the moment? One voice here, please. It's about the shared destiny and the principles and the, uh, and the impression and image that both sides have of each other and the practicalities of working together. Is we are doing that in Brussels. Um, Mr. Slaughter said there will never be United States of Europe. I would like to ask the European participants if they agree and what that means for the cooperation between the United States and an entity will, which will never be a United entity. Senator McCain, would you like to come in? Uh, okay, not at this point. Um, please. Uh, Robin Niblett, who is the director of Chatham House, the think tank uh, in London. Mark Matter Brown uh, made the point, Lord Matter Brown made the point earlier, that the shoe is on our foot, on Europe's foot, that uh, in a way we need to be bold, we need to live up to America's uh, leadership and its example so far. My impression is actually is the opposite. I think America is on trial right now um, in many Europeans' eyes, on trial on the global economy, on trial on climate change, uh, on trial on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, the how we work together is really going to be affected by this deep fact that right now Europeans don't want American leadership. They want partnership. I'm not sure Europeans can deliver partnership, but I'm not sure the Americans want to give up on leadership either. You have just issued a, a pretty devastating document at Chatham House in which you say at one point the U.S. has created new antibodies to its global leadership role. What do you mean by that? I mean that um, as the United States thinks about wanting to act and reassert a leadership role internationally, uh, in many regions of the world, people have moved on over the last four to eight years and are looking for a different type of relationship with the United States, whether it be in the Middle East, whether it be in Latin America, whether it be in Europe. Carl Bildt said Europe has uh, become more of a global power. It has its own relationships now with China, uh, with Latin America, uh, and it on the other side. So as uh, there's been a global political awakening, I think, as Big New Brzezinski has, well, has said as well, people around the world are expecting different uh, actions now from the United States uh, and are looking less for leadership. Do you accept that, Amri Slaughter? A new kind of leadership. You're emphasizing um, multilateral, uh, multipolar move forward for America now. I think we've been very clear that facing the problems we face, we need partners. Uh, that there are, there are areas where without the United States, I think in, on most of these areas, without the United States, it is very hard to solve the problems we face. Uh, so that means, yes, you need United States leadership. But leadership comes in many forms. Uh, and particularly when we face the kinds of problems we face, we need partners. We need others to take initiative. We need people to work with us. Uh, we need a focus in different parts of the world uh, where different countries can take the initiative. And we are not afraid of that. It's a sign of strength that we have active and robust partnerships. Rather than, than constantly worrying, are, you know, are we in front? It's a different kind of world. It's a different kind of leadership. But I certainly think the United States wants to be that kind of active partner and needs to exercise leadership in a number of those key areas. But are you clear what kind of new leadership it's going to be? Is it just about a new president? Because there are many who are saying this could just be a honeymoon for the president. I don't think there's one answer. If you, if you talk to me, for instance, about nuclear nonproliferation, I would say Russia and the United States have to be both in the lead, Europe also, but if without those two, 
it's very hard to, to make a move. If you talk about climate change, then that expands. Then you need, you certainly need China, you need India, you need the EU and the US working together. Uh, so in, depending on the areas you're talking about, you need different configurations of countries and the US role will be different. But what I think has been very clear is the United States has stepped up and said on some of the issues you talked about, on climate change, yes, we want to be part of the solution. Uh, on, on working on a relationship with Russia. We want to reset that relationship. Uh, in many different ways, we are, we are making very clear, and I will uh, borrow Senator Voinovich's uh, uh, reformulation, through the use of smart power, we want to use all dimensions of our power and work very collaboratively with our partners. Robert Kagan, uh, is there a danger of overselling the Obama effect? Do you think at the moment that that is happening? No, I think it's working wonderfully. I think that uh, will that be sustainable? Obama is the Obama administration is pursuing roughly similar uh, basic policies, and the world is just delighted by it. So I think that that's a very effective tactic. But my next question and was, I hope, is: and it I hope that is it, it succeeds for as long as possible. Is it sustainable? Well, it depends. It depends whether, you know, it, it's possible that it is sustainable. But, you know, as a, we're obviously going to get to these conversations later, there will be some actual concrete issues. The rhetoric is lovely. Uh, Everyone is delighted that the last administration is gone, and we can still run against the last administration, probably for another few months, I think. But at some point, then, we're actually making actual foreign policies, and we'll have to deal with actual issues, and the rhetoric of how much nicer we are than those creeps who were in the White House before isn't going to go anywhere, and we'll have to do things. Carl Bildt? No, of course we have to deal with the real issues, and the real issues are monumentally difficult. And I think what, what makes this period somewhat different from, from previous ones is that we have to deal with a number of them at the same time. Both old-style issues, if we call it the Middle East peace process, nuclear non-proliferation, the Iranian issue, Afghanistan, Pakistan, call those old, seem old issues. And then all of the new ones. We have a monumental economic crisis, the worst for 60 years. We are trying to find the common solution to that one, and we'll have to deal with that for quite some time to come. And on top of that, the climate change things. And this fundamentally challenges our ability to formulate policy, both Europeans and Americans and others, and be able to work together as an effective global coalition. It is the most momentous challenge that we've faced for a very long time because of the multitude of very diverse challenges that we face at the same time, and we can't defer them. Do you think there's a danger of over-expectations? Well, there's always a danger, but it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, honeymoons always end. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I think what's so interesting about President Obama is that he has allowed, in a sense, uh, the space to do more of the old kind of foreign policy as well as more of the new. The new is clear on issues like climate change, as Robin argues. Uh, the U.S. is a partner. It is not necessarily the leader. But what is equally striking to myself, watching this administration coming in, working for foreign policy in another country, was the huge sense of expectation and hope. Everything was put on hold to see what the American position would be on issues. So in that sense, there is still a great American leadership. And I also, I suppose it's the old UN man in me. I have to speak up for the underdog. I rather agree with, uh, with, with Bob that actually the last administration in many ways represents quite quite a lot of continuity with the new administration. And the most striking differences are where the rebooting of policy under a new leader, Obama, has actually allowed a reassertion of very old diplomacy, reaching out to Syria, Russia, China, on a very old-fashioned, but if I might say so, admirable national interest basis. But because it's Obama, it somehow is, is pulled in the light of, of values. It's not. It's good, serious foreign policy and long overdue. Well, let's explore. Um, we'll reject that dichotomy <laughs> utterly. <laughs> good old foreign policy versus values. I think they actually go together. Well, and Russia policy is a perfect example of what I'm saying. I mean, the Bush administration has been negotiating the exact same negotiations with Russia uh, and, would, and, was, and if had a third term would have moved in this direction. If my preferred candidate had won the election, uh, we would be moving in this direction. But, because, but now Obama's doing it, and it's a revolution. Um, so it's good. I say it. It's a good thing. I like it. 
Let's, let's move forward on some of these specific issues, wondering uh, if the policy stars really are in alignment, because um, the Commission President here, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, uh, did uh, write a letter, an open letter to the President, he didn't know who it might be, saying we must set an agenda for common action, this was last September, before the election, with a new Atlantic agenda now for a multilateral approach. But a large number of voices are already saying this is in danger in Afghanistan. Kurt Volker, you are the American ambassador uh, to NATO for the time being. What is your assessment of whether there's a breach coming here? Well, I think the question it really revolves around the discussion we just had because it gets to implementation. Is that we, I think all of you and the vast majority of people in this room agree that what happens in Afghanistan is critical for our security, it's critical for our transatlantic community, it's critical for dealing with a large number of problems in a much wider area, Pakistan, uh, violent extremism throughout a broader region. And when we look at what we're trying to do in Afghanistan, we say, yes, we must do that. But then we come across Robin's question, Europe waiting for the United States to solve it. And we have to say, well, is Europe prepared to put in its strategy, its commitment, its ownership, because it is equally affected and is just important to them. We see the problem in public opinion, where European publics are very skeptical of Afghanistan's uh, operations, even though at a policy and a government level, we all know how important it is. So I guess a question for the European members of the panel is, what do we have to do to build European political will and real support in Afghanistan and public opinion? But Try and enlighten us here. Is the U.S. about to sideline NATO in Afghanistan if Europe does not get closer to matching what is needed for the operation? I would put it quite the contrary. Uh, we have had an extraordinary effort on the part of the new administration to engage Europe on Afghanistan. We had Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton, and Vice President Biden twice coming across to Europe. Vice President Biden making a special trip just to meet at NATO in order to build common efforts on Afghanistan. But as he said, I'm here to consult, and that means I'm here to consult, and afterwards I hope we can do this together. Let me go to Volker at Stanzel, if I may, uh, who is the political director in the German Foreign Office. What's your view, particularly on Afghanistan, given that there are concerns that the German position at the moment is jeopardizing uh, this development of a much stronger policy? Well, let me make a general statement before, uh, because I think if you're in practical politics uh, and if you try to, to solve problems, questions such as, is the American side developing the right concept? Are the Europeans developing uh, the right attitude? Become actually quite minimal. If you're faced with an actual problem, like uh, an increasing insurgency in Afghanistan, you try to resolve that problem and you look at question number one, do you have enough hard power? Do you have enough soft power? Do we pursue? Do we have the right people on, ground, on the ground? So these are very concrete questions. And questions such as, is this the Americans or are these the Europeans, are really irrelevant by the time. Now, on Afghanistan, uh, to be a bit more specific, uh, I think from the outset on, from 2001 on, both the Americans and the Europeans have tried a lot uh, to succeed in Afghanistan and success means to make it impossible that from Afghanistan you ever have a kind of uh, terrorist insurgency or worldwide uh, terrorist network uh, working as you've had in, until 2001. And um, I think since 2001 nothing has emanated from uh, Afghanistan as has happened in the past. So we have been successful to a degree and now the practical question is how do we make sure that we are even more successful. And as I have the microphone, let me make that one statement on the honeymoon. I mean, a honeymoon ends, but I think uh, while it lasts, it's very enjoyable, and uh, I think we should enjoy it for a bit more. <laughs> but are you in Germany jeopardizing this honeymoon because of your reluctance not to commit in the way that certainly the Americans might like, despite what we just heard from the U.S. ambassador to NATO? Uh, I'm surprised we're not committing. The largest uh, uh, contingent of soldiers that Germany has abroad is in, is in Afghanistan. But that's not the, and, the widely and, held and view. There, and there. Yeah, please, I try to convert you. Um, but uh, they're in the north of Afghanistan. And uh, do we have an insurgency in the north of Afghanistan compared to we have, what we have in the south? No, we don't. And why is that? I think because we're so successful there. Would you commit? Uh, 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 that, that was not really meant as a joke. 
Um, Ambassador Stanzel, there is an interesting reaction from around this room on that point. But you could rotate into southern Afghanistan. Carl Bildt. No, but I think Kurt Volker had, uh, had a very relevant question. Uh, and, and it is a fact that public opinion in Europe is somewhat less keen on the Afghanistan operation. I think one of the reasons for that is that we tended to, in television pictures and otherwise, overemphasize the just military aspect of it. We presented it as a, just as a war that you can win by bombing and doing whatever. We all know that what we're involved in there is a long-term peace and stability operation. Where a military search might be necessary in order to secure the election, I think that's correct. But a civilian political search, economic search, is perhaps the decisive element in order to win that particular battle. And if we can give that image of the combined nature of what we are trying to do in Afghanistan and Pakistan and the wider region, I think that will get profound European support. Within that, the military component obviously being key, but is not the only one. Mark Malik, let, let me just come back to Mark, Mark, Mark Malik Brown. When you. When you've heard that about Afghanistan, rejecting some of these unofficial background reports suggesting the U.S. is now getting uh, much tougher, thinking that it may have to marginalize Europe uh, within NATO, if there is not a much more substantive matching commitment on military hardware and troops in Afghanistan, do you see that as a danger? Well, look, I mean, I think the U.S. has been trailing this since the campaign where both candidates made it clear uh, they were going to do a lot more in Afghanistan and the challenge has been out there to Europe to respond adequately. Now, I mean, I think very, very frankly, both the Europe and certainly a country like the UK, which does have a large contingent there, uh, as well as the US, are facing a war which at the moment doesn't have an obvious end to it. And that is very hard to mobilize public opinion in any country. But clearly the United States has a rather different view, putting in 17,000 more troops, much more commitment, a realization that something, a success is possible. Well, I think the US too is struggling with the issue that you can surge like that, but you need a clear exit strategy and you need a clear definition of victory. And you need to deal with this, if you like, creeping uh, expansion of the mission that you can't really solve Afghanistan without solving Pakistan. Uh, and so we now have this word AFPAC, which is being banded around a lot. So getting our arms around it, having a mission which recalibrates between just military activity to development and institution building and getting a decent, honest, legitimate government which speaks for the Afghan people and which they trust in. Getting all of these pieces right uh, is something that we need to combine around. And I do think, going back to my earlier metaphor of the shoes on our foot, I think Europe has got to show the US that in our different ways, we're there with them with a sufficient contribution. To but is that, is, that, is that underlining uh, these uh, unofficial reports suggesting that really America is now expecting that if Europe doesn't commit, there could be a marginalizing of Europe and it'll become more of a unilateral coalition of the willing I rather than NATO. I think it's a bit of a mischief making because there were always going to be two American generals. That, that, that is an arrangement which goes back to last year and the last administration. I think if this administration you know, has learned one lesson from the experience of Iraq, it's the last thing you want to do is reduce down to a coalition of the willing. You want clear military command structures but within a broad, legitimate UN base. And the great glory of Afghanistan is from the beginning it's had full Security Council support, the full support of the whole membership. This is a war which everybody recognizes the good guys have to prevail and you don't want to lose that. Anne-Marie Slaughter and Robert Kagan, are you convinced by these voices from Europe on this critical issue of Afghanistan? I think I can predict that I am and he's not, but let me, let me, uh, so let me start uh, I have not uh, heard anything about the marginalization of NATO in Afghanistan or the marginalization of Europe in Afghanistan. I think quite the contrary. Uh, the meeting at the end of uh, the meeting uh, very shortly on on uh, what on a new strategy in Afghanistan actually reflects the desire to reassess what the goals are, how do we achieve them, uh, so that we have a strategy that is agreed on by all parties. So that's that's really recognition that we. We do have to do this together, but I think very much recognition uh, that we are we are going to uh, be there and stay there uh, until we can achieve that strategy. Is this honeymoon, as it's been described, at risk over Afghanistan? 
I don't think it's at risk. I think this, the president signaled very clearly uh, when he was in Berlin as a candidate that on Afghanistan uh, he wanted Europe, uh, he was going to ask more of Europe. And he's made that very clear. He is going to. I think the Europeans understand that. But I think from the European point of view, as has been said, the Americans have to recognize this is a broader challenge. It is not just about troops. It is a multi-pronged effort on the civilian side as well as the military side. And Europe has a great deal to contribute. Robert Kagan. I don't think the honeymoon will be over in terms of whether, how the administration feels about Europe. And I agree, obviously, they're trying very hard to get European involvement. But as a de facto matter, as, Europe, as American troops ramp up, other troops are ramping down. I mean, the Canadians are going to be withdrawing, right? Uh, another country is going to be withdrawing, at least to some extent. Canadians and so the Canadians are Americans. Well, there's a European North view America. for you. Oh. There's a European view for you. We can have another discussion about that someday. But anyway, um, so uh, Dave, the reality is going to be there's a higher percentage of American forces vis-a-vis -vis allied forces. It's unavoidable. Uh, and I just am concerned at a time when public opinion in the United States on Afghanistan is a little shaky, partly because of the Obama administration's declaring that it's impossible, when Americans don't like to fight impossible wars either, but, but if, uh, if that opinion is shaky and the appearances that Europe is not contributing, I worry about a deeper groundswell in the United States, regardless of what the Obama administration wants. Carl Bildt. No, but I think what, what you would, I, I think you would see additional US for, uh, European forces there, but that's not going to be the key thing. You're going to see more European police, you're going to see trainers, you're going to see mentors, you're going to be right uh, rule of the law, you're going to see more of development assistance, you're going to see more of the state building. These are more long-term, somewhat less spectacular things. Yeah. But well, I would Washington argue be convinced absolutely by that. key to success. Well, there is no Washington, as, as you've already pointed out. But I, I do think, and again, now we're talking about not just the United States, but about the UK as well. I mean, it's the British Defense Secretary who says it's not fair that a couple of countries are doing all the fighting and dying while other countries are doing police training and all that kind of stuff. I'm well, not that's a division that's of Europe, important. isn't it? I'm not saying that isn't important. Uh, but that is a problem. It, it, let's just not pretend it's not a problem, because it is. Well, look, we're, we're, we're shaking the can in the run-up to the NATO summit. We want to get as many <laughs> troops there as possible, and we want to get as big a contribution on the police and development side. But he's highlighting the risk if they're not committed. Yeah, no, no, I think we've, we've got to get there. But I think, you know, also, frankly, we've got to sort of stop for a moment and think some of these issues of military doctrine which have opened up in recent years. You know, one is those years when Europe wasn't spending enough on defense, and a whole technology lead was opened up by the US, which really has put the American armed forces in a unique place in the world. The second is speaking for my own country, which has had long commitments in both Afghanistan and Iraq, is we were organized around the idea of expeditionary forces, which in the concept of liberal interventionism would go in, fix the Balkans, get out, go into Sierra Leone, get out. And the way we've gotten tied down in these theaters is posing real challenges to capacity, extreme challenges to us, less to the rest of Europe, which is not, you know, is not deployed at anything like the combined level we have. But I think we've got to have frank conversations about those issues too, and not reduce it to a kind of simple headcount argument. How does the free world organize its security collectively and in a shared, fair way so that we can defend freedom everywhere? But isn't there a yellow card already from the Vice President Joe Biden who in Munich said, America will do more, but America will ask more from our partners. In other words, there's a clarity there of what America expects. That's a, a risk for Europe, isn't it, Carl Bildt, if Europe does not deliver? Absolutely, and we will deliver. I mean, one of the key things that we discussed when Vice President Biden was here was how do you organize the election? How do we get the funding? How do we get the experts? How do we get the election monitors in there? That's not easy either. But there the Americans were saying, we need your help to do that. We discussed the police training. Uh, we discussed a lot of the other sorts of issues. I think we need to get rid of the notion that we're going to win the Afghan war by foreign forces. It's been tried before. It's not going to work. It's only by building the institutions of Afghanistan itself, the army, the police, the political structures, the economy, and that will require far more broad effort than you're sending in a couple of brigades. I'm all in favor of that. That's necessary. But the effort has to be far broader. It has to mobilize the entire international community to do that, be that all of America, North and South, be that all of Europe, East and West, 
be that all of the UN. We're talking about what Mr. Obama called a shared destiny. What about during this financial crisis in these few days before the G20 yeah. meeting and the decision here in Brussels uh, within recent days by Europe not to commit on more borrowing, more spending, well, a, a di greater division? Is this now beginning to open up one of the fissures? Well, call it whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's a profound debate. And, and, and you can argue both. I mean, I am concerned at the moment. My main, one of my main concerns uh, on the international financial scene is that we have these huge deficits that's going to be financed. I mean, huge deficit in a couple of countries. You, you can hear this big sucking sound. All of the capital is disappearing from the Pakistans, from the Ukraines, from the Indonesias. Where's the money going to come to finance there? But we're talking about transatlantic relations. Well, we're Mr. talking about transatlantic relations. We're relation talking about the expectations yeah, in America quite, absolutely. and the demand from absolutely. Larry but, Summers but this is, and Tim Geithner. Yeah, absolutely. But this is at the core of this particular debate. Some Europeans, and I belong to them, are concerned with the build-up of so huge deficits that we're going to have this sucking sound that are going to deprive Africa, Pakistan, Ukraine, whatever, weak economies, fragile states of their possibility of financing their deficits. I mean, it's a question also of a little bit of global solidarity when it comes to sharing the capital that's available. Given that you represent Africa and Asia and many emerging nations in the, in the IMF meeting a few days ago in Dar es Salaam, it was apocalyptic about what Africa yeah. now faces. Is that argument going to resonate in Washington when they're saying more borrowing, more spending, get us out well, of this crisis? Look, I think one of the big things we're trying to do for this G20 summit in London is have a big <laughs> chapter on it about what we're going to do for poor nations, which for a while felt out, uh, relatively immune to this crisis because they don't have develop, particularly developed or liberalized banking sectors. Now that it's become a real economy crisis and commodity prices are down, exports are down, it's hitting them right between the eyes and it's not job only they're losing, but in some cases, you know, people are being driven into poverty and terrible conditions by this. So I think there will be a united view, and, and uh, having done a lot of the preparatory work on my Prime Minister's behalf on this summit, I know there will be a united view between the US and Europe on this. But We've at a lower, a lower common denominator, that's what's being suggested. No, well, I hope not on, I mean, not on this particular issue of helping poor countries. There may be a different approach between Carl's point that you don't want to drive, squeeze them out of the, the, the debt markets by us consuming all the capital available and the view of providing fresh support for them. But behind that debate about approaches, there's a common, I think, view that we've got to do something very significant for them. Anne-Marie Slaughter, does Washington understand these voices from here in Brussels and around Europe about concern about the developing world and the impact that this constant demand for more spending, more borrowing to try and um, generate um, a wealth turnaround at least within the developed world which is suffering so badly, is that accepted in Washington? I don't think there's disagreement on the end at all. I mean, the, President Bush doubled foreign aid uh, Secretary Clinton has made very clear that development and diplomacy are the twin pillars of American foreign policy on the civilian side. She stands very strongly for expanding development aid. I think there's great agreement in the need to, to have resources for developing countries. Uh, where there may be disagreements is how you revive economies uh, enough to have those resources to provide. And that, those are economic disagreements. Once again, uh, with 28 countries, uh, if you put the EU and the US together, of course they're going to be economic disagreements. But the overall view that we must be able not only to revive our own economies, but to maintain uh, income for developing countries, is it's the right thing to do. It's also the prudent and essential thing to do from a security point of view. Robert Kagan, what view are you taking of what you've seen in recent weeks uh, here in Europe about the concern of not going too far when it comes to matching what the president wants on a stimulus package? Well, I have no opinion because I don't understand anything that's going on economically. But, but is I it will say the following thing, which is it's, what's amusing to me is that it's not my side of the street that's picking this fight uh, with Europe. It's Anne-Marie's side of the street. It's top administration officials who've been very critical of Europe's uh, refusal to move forward with the stimulus package. I may be more sympathetic with Europe possibly on this. It's Paul Krugman, who, as you know, is the actual economic advisor of the Obama administration, who says that Europe is failing 
miserably to deal with this fundamental crisis. So uh, this is one where my side of the street is, uh, where the, you, you are like the UN, we're neutral observers to this fight. <laughs> What impact is that, though, having on the president's words before he became president of the need uh, to recognize this as a shared destiny? What we've seen here on the financial crisis is not exactly a sharing of, of the outlook of the way it should be handled. Well, I'm sure it'll all be papered over and we'll have all the nice rhetoric that we're used to. Yeah. 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 Well, look, I mean, I, I think this summit really matters, if I may say so, because we, it's got, whatever the outcome, it's got to restore confidence to six billion plus people in the world, some of them shareholders, all of them consumers, uh, most of them, all of them family people and workers. Uh, and, you know, the whole world has got to, before long, say, there are people in charge here, they have a plan, they're driving the global economy in the same direction. And, you know, we've got to get there. We can't have patched over words. We need an agreement which shows a common direction and one of a substantive meeting of minds with a real, a, a real action plan and we're going to be in trouble. Let me move on finally to another area about uh, U.S. relations to other parts of the world and in this multipolar world, uh, how this relationship we've been talking about between the U.S. and Europe fits in. Can I go to voices from way out there uh, on the other side of the world, beyond the Atlantic? Can I go to Shekhar Gupta, please, who's editor-in-chief of the Indian Express Group? When you listen to this kind of discussion here, Shekhar Gupta, what do you reflect uh, on as you sit normally in Delhi in South Asia, in a fast emerging economy? Well, this, to me it could sound like uh, maybe coalition partners in the government in India talking. Uh, <laughs> there's about that much agreement between... Uh, Which government? The, uh, the one that, well, this or the next or the last one, all coalitions uh, of the unwilling. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but some things concer uh, concern us uh, coming... Uh, from where we do. One is, uh, as Robert Kagan said, uh, said this, new, this new line that's coming out of Washington that maybe the war in Afghanistan is unwinnable. Now that's a very complicated thing because this is one patient. You cannot leave on the opera opera operating table now without stitching it up. Uh, you can't go away from Afghanistan without winning this war because if you do so, Think of the consequences it will leave behind for Pakistan. Ahmad Rashid's their br brilliant journalist from Pakistan, spent 10 minutes with, with him, and he will tell you wh what will happen. And consequences for us, because if you look at the list of terrorists caught around the world, there's hardly been any Afghan. Afghanistan is just a place. You leave it to God knows who, there will be trouble that nobody will be able to sort out for decades and decades and decades. So I think that is a, that, that's a worrying thing. I think, I think we'd like to see a bit more agreement and unanimity on that. Now, one thing on which, uh, having traveled a little bit to Afghanistan lately, I find unanimity in Afghanistan is just the quality, sir, of European soldiers there. Uh, I think if German soldiers have done so well in the north, might be a good idea to move them to the south so, <laughs> so they, they can do some re real soldiering work. Because, because it, there are many jokes about German soldiers, particularly. Uh, most European soldiers in Afghanistan, they work 10 to 5. They don't lift anything heavier than their paychecks, while the <laughs> Americans and the British and the others are fighting. So I think there are serious problems. Uh, Afghanistan will need a more serious commitment. But could I ask you, Sheikh Gupta, about the strategic relationship between America and Europe? You, after all, in India, are building a new strategic relationship between India and the United States. What do you see in terms of the new polarity of global power here? Well, I think uh, uh, we see that we see the tensions, and we quite frankly quite enjoy th th those, those tensions because I think now you can see that there is room for maneuver. Uh, because if it was all one line of thinking, then it would be tougher for uh, for new kids on the block, so to say, who have who have their own interests and who want their own equations with the U.S. as well as with Europe. So, so we are not particularly dismayed by that. But what worries us is uh, when disagreements come up or lack of commitment comes up on uh, issues which can have reper repercussions in our neighborhood. Right. I'll take some other uh, one or two more voices on this issue of beyond Europe and how there's a balancing going on or is there no balancing going on. Let me ask uh, Robert Kagan, uh, what do you think about whether Asia is beginning to counterbalance this relationship, this big relationship traditionally between uh, Europe and the United States? Is something changing fundamentally or not? 
Well, there is no Asia, uh, even less than there is a Europe. And, and this whole notion that, there, that Asia is all of one thing. There is competition within Asia, as Indians would uh, be the first to uh, acknowledge with, with uh, dealing with China. Uh, Japan worried about China. And so um, there isn't Asia counterbalancing. But this general concern that, that Europeans constantly have in every decade, and I don't blame them because Americans in every decade say this is the Asian century, this is the Asian decade. Uh, but I don't think think that you're, you're seeing a kind of movement of the United States toward Asia as opposed to toward Europe. And I don't see Asia, if you're asking, is Asia unifying as a balancing force? I don't see that happening. Anne-Marie Slaughter, you've just spent a year uh, in Shanghai. Does that mean you have a rather different view sitting in the State Department in Washington about the real politique of global power now? No. Uh, and I don't think you're asking the right question, because the... Well, you asked the question I should have asked, and then answer it. Okay, I will. <laughs> the, but I don't think... This is not zero-sum politics. The foundation of U.S.-European relations after the Second World War is we wanted a strong, prosperous Europe. We don't lose as the United States because Europe rises, we gain. And similarly, if Europe has a strategic relationship with India and if we have a strategic relationship with India, that's great. We do not see ourselves as losing if the Europeans also have a relationship with India. And indeed, as I said earlier, the U.S. policy toward China has been to encourage China's rise, to encourage a stable, prosperous China. We again and we don't think that is a threat. Now, certainly we watch, because China and we do not have the same fundamental values that Europe and we do, but it's not, it, it's not a world anymore where one nation being up automatically means another nation is down. And I don't see this idea that we, we now turn to China and Europe is no longer uh, essential. On the contrary, I see Europe and the United States being essential partners in dealing with the rest of the world. But can I put to you what uh, your Secretary of State said before she uh, got the appointment, uh, she said, our relationship with, with China will be, quote, the most important bilateral relationship in the world this century. Does that begin to shift to one side, Europe? No, I think what she was saying is that is an absolutely critical relationship because if we get it wrong, the entire world is imperiled. That's not a statement about downgrading other countries. Indeed, she just was in Japan. Her first stop was in Japan. Which, of uh, course, led to a suggestion or a fear that actually that means that the U.S. is focusing more over it, there than here. It does. As I said, I don't think that's the right framework uh, for thinking about it. I think, on the contrary, it is a critically important relationship for, for the world, for climate change, for the economy, uh, for military security. We have to get that relationship right. But saying that that does not mean we then look to Asia and we don't look to Europe. I think we have to recognize that Europe and America play somewhat different roles in different parts of the world. I mean, the United States has a security role in East Asia. That is critical also from the European point of view. We can't replace it. We don't seek to replace it. We respect it. We support it. We Europeans perhaps have a role in Africa. Uh, when it comes to uh, humanitarian and peace operations and conflict resolution, that is well above what America, for a number of reasons, is able to do. And then we should see the complementarity. Uh, but also that we can work working together in these different areas, respecting the respective roles that we have and supporting each other. But then, of course, we are also developing, and we are, I mean, one of the amazing facts, we talked about the development of the European Union. We are, since a couple of weeks, I think it is, operating an EU naval force in the Indian Ocean, uh, outside the coast of Somalia. That was unthinkable a couple of I would have even said months ago, uh, but we are now doing it. And that's a sign of even us being engaged on more strategic hard issues in fairly far away corners of the world. Let me finally ask you um, about where this will be in a, in a year's time. Will you, a year into the Obama administration, be talking very upbeat, very, very optimistic uh, about the way things have moved? Or do you fear that this is, to uh, go back to that to one word, a honeymoon period, which inevitably, as we've seen with other administrations, will lead to greater difficulties? 
Look, I think this administration has very cleverly unleashed some very big beasts of foreign policy on a range of issues from the Middle East to Afghanistan to Iran under a Secretary of State who has a higher profile than any Secretary of State in living memory under a President who's got more global standing than any President in probably living memory. And I think that is not short honeymoon stuff. I think it gives a huge forward momentum to deal with a series of issues where globally we had arrived at a deficit on. We were way behind where we should be on the Middle East or Iran or China. I think this is an opportunity for a great catching up. As I said earlier, I think it's wrong to see it as a complete discontinuity with what came before. The problem with the Bush administration was it was constantly fighting against its own first term. You needed a new cast of characters to demonstrate the break, but the real break was not a few months ago, it was four years and some months ago. And I think the U.S. is coming back, building strongly, and if it can now overcome this toxic reputational stuff that goes back to the first Bush term, I think this can be a very good period for Europe, U.S. policy, but much more significantly for the world. Are you all convinced by this? No. Right. One voice here, please. Could you just... I, I can only take very short uh, interventions, please. But, who, well, you, you, okay, I didn't hear which voice it was. I said, I said no, because we, we went through this whole subject of, you know, are we united in Afghanistan? Are we speaking, Bob said this very well, are we speaking with one voice or past each other, essentially? And we moved right on without ever really bringing anything but more and more examples that that's what's happening. You know, when I've spent the last nine years working with Europeans, they tell me everything, including many of the problems we see in Afghanistan and Pakistan, can be traced back to the fact that we look at Israel and the Palestinian situation so differently as to not reach any reasonable conclusion to that, at least since 67, certainly uh, since the creation of Israel. And as long as we don't do that, most Europeans that I speak to or listen to, they will tell me we're not going to get to a conclusion because Europeans see it as the problem that they're fighting around the world rather than settling on behalf of the people in that region. So, you know, we have something we look at so differently, and we didn't even talk about it here because it's the, it's the elephant that's sitting in the room. We are prepared to confront other elephants, but we don't have the time to confront every elephant. Please. Warsaw. Uh, I would also say uh, yes. Could you just with, repeat with, it again, with please? Big question. Re Eugen repeat again. Eugen you're smaller from Warsaw. Uh, I would say yes, but with the big question marks. I see uh, now in preparation of the 60th anniversary summit, NATO, NATO summit meeting, I see some debates among the Europeans which are not helping to solve this problem. For example, a leading French, uh, a leading uh, German. Uh, the security personality in Warsaw only last Friday asked question, should we imagine Europe without American involvement? The question being put in such a manner tells you something. There is also within NATO, there is an old Gaulish tradition of confronting the Anglo-Saxons. So the American delegation goes to the Hungarians to put a proposal to get it passed because otherwise a French diplomat would be happy in Kedorse that he confronted the Anglo-Saxons. So I'm saying we have a lot of problems among the Europeans and America is not on trial. Uh, administrations comes and goes, but the policy set in continuity of Americans' involvement and the security responsibility cannot be matched by Europeans. Could you pass the microphone back? Uh, yes, you there, sir. Let's stay where you are. Thank you very much. One, one, one moment. Let's get, get the microphone up, please. It'll, it'll, it'll come on. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Yamamoto. I'm from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, and I like to add a voice from uh, Japan, Japanese side. Um, I think, you know, we talked about uh, the willingness of uh, Obama administration to have partnership with Europe, listen to the uh, voices of Europe, and trying to achieve the same purposes and objectives in foreign policy in other areas. The Obama administration is doing the same thing with regard to Japan. Uh, now, this is, I think, in a way, our effort on the part of the Obama administration to try to show leadership globally, because issues around the world really do require the efforts to bring the efforts of various players together. And uh, we in Japan applaud this. But I think we have to also uh, look to Europe and ask Europe to play similarly uh, engaging role with the players of the other part of the world, which I think is lacking. For instance, Japan has just sent a fleet to the Indian Ocean for anti-piracy. Uh, these are the kind of things which will really help 
the partnership between Europe and America as well as Japan. Thank you. President Saakashvili, then uh, the microphone further back, please. Yes. Um, well, I mean, there is a bunch of uh, very competent people coming to the new administration, but I sometimes have an impression that, you know, several groups of people were sitting. You know, some one group was preparing concept for non non nuclear non-proliferation, the other one for Afghanistan, the third one for reset, etc. And then, you know, when they come together and each of them wants to advance this agenda, maybe without thinking about the other things. And I think that's where the real thing comes, with coordination. And what coordination can be based on? The values. There is no old, new, you know, good foreign policy. We lived through that old good foreign policy. It was a nightmare. We lived in the Soviet Union. And we hated every deals and the trade-offs which we made at the expense of values. You know, right now we are facing a situation when, for the first time since the 30s, big power in Europe is trying to change borders with the use of force. You cannot neglect that elephant. And you know, it's not the way you see it with the reset, which we, we, you know, we welcome the engagement. The issue is, you know, we welcome dialogue with Iran. So I strongly welcome it, but I'm just coming back from UAE and people are asking questions. You know, what about us? What, what will happen in that kind of dialogue? When you go to, to the, with Russia, it's, it's natural for us, for Ukrainians, for the others to ask the same question. Because the other guys don't see that way. The other guys have their own perceptions of what it all, all might mean. So again, the best recipe from our point of view is something based on the values. Well, that's what America is respected for. You know, we sometimes talk, oh, America is not respected because of this and that and that lost position. Excuse me, in my country, many other countries sitting here, America is specifically expected, is respected for the values that America represents. And that has not changed for us. Mr. President, thank you. Can I, just before we close, can I just ask both uh, of the Americans uh, here representing the view from Washington, the different views from Washington, um, whether you think there will be a significant audit within the next year or two of a dramatic transatlantic unity emerging or not? Anne-Marie Slaughter. I would begin by seconding Mark Malik's Brown's point about the importance of, of the G20 conference and the moment we are in history in terms of the global economy and the importance of working together uh, to, to restore confidence in the global economy. I'm going to assume we're going to do that. Uh, and if we are, then this time next year, I expect Europe and the United States to be arguing vociferously about an entire range of issues because the Europe, Europe, Europe-U.S. partnership, a partnership of 800,000 people, 40 percent of the world's GDP, is the most successful partnership. Million people. What? 800 million people. 800 million. What did I say? Billion? Well, there is a demographic, <laughs> there's a demographic problem, so it's 800 million. 800, but it's the most important partnership the world has ever seen. When it's working properly, we are engaged with one another. That's, that, the problem with Iraq was not that we differed. It was we differed so greatly we were not actually together, uh, together arguing. We are together in Afghanistan. We will argue uh, for as long as we are partners. But I, and that's not a honeymoon. That's situation normal. But it's a very powerful partnership, disagreements included. So, Robert Kagan, will you still be writing in a few years' time, maybe a year or two from now, that really U.S. and Europeans, quote, no longer share a common strategic culture? Well, I don't really think it's good to keep writing the same thing over and over again. I wrote Will that you still once. be thinking that and saying on. it in a different I'm way? I'm going to move on from talk about other things. But uh, look, the honeymoon is going to be over uh, a year because right now everything is possible. Right now we can work out our relations with the Russians and have a reset, never mind the Russian troops that are still on Georgian territory in violation of the French agreement and are building a base. We can talk to the Iranians and get them to drop their nuclear program. Uh, we can work together and fix Afghanistan. We can solve uh, missile defense problems. But in a year, it's going to be obvious that none of these problems uh, have been so easily uh, dealt with. And then the things that do divide us in our friendship will come to the fore and we will be disagreeing about what to do about a Russia that uh, still has forces in Georgia, what to do about an Iran that is closer and closer to uh, a nuclear weapon, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. And I do believe we will have, in some cases, profound disagreements about what to do about it. 
Well, let me thank you all very much indeed, Robert Kagan, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Lord Mark Malek-Brown and Carl Bildt, and all of you here at the uh, Brussels Forum of the German Marshall Fund for that very spirited debate underlining that there's very robust dialogue between Washington and Europe, even if there isn't a lot of agreement on many issues, but there is growing agreement on some issues like climate change and others. From me, Nick Gowing, in Brussels, and this BBC World Debate, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you all. That was really a terrific beginning to the Brussels Forum. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back for